Yeah. <laughs> At, least At least if you live, you live in parts of Kansas, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Couldn't believe it. It's like, oh, yeah, who just torches a wheat field like that? At least harvest the grain, then torch it. Yeah, that's right. All right, Dale. That's it just is, insulting. It's 530, so we're going to get started. Okay. Here. Why don't you go ahead and start sharing your screen? I'll kind of go over the rules again. Uh, I know this is kind of monotonous. We go over them every week, but for those who are attending and this is your first time, um, you are all on mute. And if you have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to ask those either in the Q&A portion or in the chat bar on the side. Um, and then we're gonna let Dale go again here. This is gonna be similar to our perennial pastures webinar that we did two weeks ago. If you've missed any webinars and would like to watch those, they are on our YouTube page, or you can go to our website and just search webinars, and they are all listed there. He did an excellent uh, webinar on establishing and diversifying perennial pastures two weeks ago that you can go see. This is gonna be a similar format. We're gonna let him go for about 45 minutes and then open it up to your guys' questions. So as you are listening and paying attention, if you've got questions, feel free to either type them up or hold them to the end. So with that, I'm gonna let Dale go. He has been an agronomist and sales rep for us at Green Cover Seed for the last four, did we decide if it's four or five years, Dale? I believe it's four. Okay, we're going with four well, years. It just seems time. like five to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, we're very blessed to have him uh, on our team, just the amount of the wealth of knowledge that he brings and wanted to share that with you guys. So with that, Dale, why don't you go ahead and talk about why biology is so important for cutting your input costs? Well, okay. Well, I guess I'll, I'll start with uh, a, a dream that I know a lot of us share, and that is um, someday passing our farms on down to our children and their grandchildren that our farms will be a source of wealth and prosperity and happiness for generations to come within our family. And sadly, that's <laughs> there are some forces at work that are uh, interfering with that. And obviously we're uh, faced with some very low prices and, and it's put some people in some, some bad situations. Now, we don't have a lot of control over what commodity prices are. Now, some of us are selling direct and that's been helpful. And um, we don't have a lot of power over what the prices of our input costs are. But we do have a lot of, and, and this powerlessness has led to a lot of depression, hopelessness, and it's in some cases become very serious. And so I, I think if we can, and a lot of the, the depression, the hopelessness is obviously financial stress, uh, you know, the, the almighty dollar. Uh, but it's not so much the, the dollars as it is the feeling of, of hopelessness and powerlessness, because we, we can't control the price of what we sell. Or we can't control the price of what we're buying. But what we can control is how much of those inputs we have to buy. Is there a way of, of farming in a manner where we spend less money on inputs and still maintain the same or you know, similar uh, yield levels? And, and so let's take a look at some things that maybe we can do. Um, I think one of the, uh, showing a picture here of nitrogen deficient corn plant. And if you look at you do an enterprise analysis if you're growing corn. Obviously, nitrogen fertilizer is is a very big expense. And um, are there ways we can manage around it? Well, I mean, everybody's aware that you can provide nitrogen with legumes. Um, known that for roughly two thousand years, uh, Roman authors talked about rotating with legume crops and, and their observations on that before they understood what was going on. Um, because nitrogen fertilizer became so cheap after World War II, 
uh, we altered our crop rotations and our cropping patterns where we, we really don't fully utilize legumes as a nitrogen source like we used to. And so can we utilize legumes more effectively to reduce our nitrogen fertilizer cost? And I think the first thing we need to, to discuss is, is just how much nitrogen can you expect from a legume cover crop? What's realistic? And, and what are some, some possibilities? Well, first thing, how much nitrogen do you get from a legume cover crop? Your legume, it's entirely dependent on biomass. A legume, most of the nitrogen that a legume crop is going to fix is going to be in the biomass of the legume. Some of it will be out in the root exudates, but most of it, almost all of it in a, an annual legume will be in biomass in the plant in the form of protein. And they're about 18, 19% protein on a dry matter basis. And because protein is one sixth nitrogen, that equates to about 3% nitrogen on legume biomass. So if you have, let's just say, three tons per acre of legume biomass out there in the form of a cover crop, that's going to have about, see, 6,000 pounds times 3%, 180 pounds of nitrogen. You think, wow, that's, that's quite a little bit. That's, that's as much as I put on a dry land corn crop. I've got it made. Well, but here's a caveat with that. When that nitrogen, when that legume biomass is degraded, first of all, when you kill it, it's not immediately available to your next crop. That's both good and bad as we'll discuss later. Um, but microbes have to work that over, chew it up, spit it out. And microbes are going to retain about half of that nitrogen within the first growing season half of it will be available to your crop. So of that, in our example, three tons of legume biomass per acre, 180 pounds total, about half of that is gonna be available to our crop or 90 pounds. Well, that's, that's helpful, that's good, but it may not meet our complete needs of our crop. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that this is not gonna be very, very useful because what happens to the remaining nitrogen? What about the half that's not available? And it's still there. It didn't go away, it didn't disappear. About half of that half will be available in year two and half of the remainder. Uh, so, you know, this year you get a half, next year you get a quarter, the following year you get an eighth, following year you get a 16th. If you do this cover cropping thing every year, then you start adding quarters and halves and eighths, a quarter from previous year and an eighth from two years ago and a, and a 16th from three years ago. You can see you start stacking, you start building this pool of available nitrogen in carbon-based forms every year. And the longer you're in this, the bigger that pool's gonna become and the less dependent on fertilizer nitrogen you're gonna become. So this is something that gets better and better every time you do it. But the first year out, ha have realistic expectations of how much. And, and you can go out there and measure the biomass and get a pretty good estimate of about how much is going to be available. If you figure that that legume biomass is about 3% nitrogen. And if your next crop is corn, uh, a corn crop, whole plant is going to be maybe somewhere around uh, one to one and a half percent nitrogen. Um, you, it's pretty easy to realize that it takes, you know, about three, uh, uh, each pound of legume biomass is going to be enough to grow about one pound of corn biomass when you figure the half availability and the rest of the nitrogen might have to be supplemented in another form. But it's, it's still a significant contribution. And so what are some crops that we can use to grow some nitrogen and how do we fit them into the rotation? 
Well, this is Crimson Clover. It's one of our winter annuals. So the winter annual uh, legumes be things like Crimson Clover, Balanza Clover, Hairy Vetch, some of the uh, little less, uh, less winter hardy ones like Common Vetch or Spring Peas, um, Winter Peas. Can, can all fit into crop rotations in other, other ways. But these are ones that can be grown in between row crops. You know, these are ones that can occupy the ground during the winter uh, because growing conditions are not as conducive to plant growth in the winter, obviously, as they are in the summer. Um, the nitrogen fixation per day of growth is not as great, but um, the window is usually very long and you're not you're not taking out of summer row crops. If you're in a summer row crop area, like most of the Midwest is, people are very unwilling to give up that summer period in order to grow nitrogen. So that's where winter cover crops can come in. The value you get out of a winter cover crop depends mostly on how long you let it grow in the spring. April 1st, you're gonna have maybe 20% of your nitrogen fixation potential achieved with a winter cover crop. So if you're killing it early and planting corn, like most people want to plant corn in April, it seems like, um, you're not going to get a huge amount of benefit from a legume cover crop as, as far as nitrogen. Now there's other benefits, obviously, you know, the root exudates and all that, but the nitrogen fixation value, uh, probably 80% of that on a winter legume is going to occur between the 1st of April and the 1st of June. If you are willing to delay the planting of your next crop into late May, early June, you can, you can really generate a substantial amount of nitrogen from these winter annual legumes. If you're planting early, maybe not so much. Another window that I think we fail to use, um, especially in the Corn Belt, and this is where having a cereal grain in the rotation can be very, very beneficial. And that's using some of the summer annual legumes. Uh, this is sun hemp. This, uh, this particular sun hemp crop was planted double crop after wheat harvest. This was in the Kansas, Kansas River Valley to be a northwest of Topeka. This particular field had never raised a corn crop to maturity because it was just sugar sand no organic matter, no clay, no water holding capacity whatsoever, but look at the biomass and the nitrogen that's contained in this crop. I mean, this, this is a pretty impressive legume, but you can do even better than this. Remember, what we're doing with biology is we're harnessing the, the things we get for free, sunlight, carbon dioxide, um, rainfall, we're harnessing those to produce biological energy from photosynthesis to feed microbes that work for us. We're feeding our workers with free inputs. So um, it's all about capturing sunlight and converting it into, in this case, nitrogen. So one way of doing that better is like what I have shown here. This is a cowpea plant that is vining up a sun hemp plant. Now, the sun hemp picture I showed you earlier, you noticed the sun hemp plants are very vertical. Um, a lot of sunlight can go down between the plants and hit the soil and get wasted. We don't want that sunlight wasted. We want a, every little photon that hits that field, we want captured and put to use, photosynthesizing, so these plants can send energy to the bacteria on the roots that make nitrogen. When you combine the sun hemp and the cowpeas together, the cowpeas will bind up those plants, spread leaf area. You can fit three acres of leaves into one acre of land by having that big corrugated canopy and capture every little bit of sunlight out there and put it to work making nitrogen. And so um, that can give you just a lot more efficient canopy. Now, another means of fixing biological nitrogen 
is, is not with legumes, although that's, that's a lot of people are aware of legumes, but another source of nitrogen that a lot of people are not aware of are free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, the first soil bacteria ever actually scientifically recognized and given a Latin name was called Bayerinkia uh, after the person who discovered it. And Bayerinkia is a free living nitrogen fixing microbe. The uh, organism, the Clostridium bacteria, like the ones that cause tetanus and overeating disease in sheep, um, blackleg in cattle, those are nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, we have pretty well ignored the potential of these organisms in this country um, because fertilizer has been cheap and readily abundant for a long period of time. Um, although given our current prices, you know, it's arguable whether fertilizer is actually still cheap. Um, so what's the potential of these free living nitrogen fixing bacteria? Uh, these are bacteria that can fix nitrogen really in the rhizosphere of just about any plant. And the more sugar that plant produces, the more they're capable of fixing. So uh, high sugar exudate type plants like uh, corn and particularly sorghum, these microbes can go to town. I'll show you some, some data from some foreign research. Uh, this is from Brazil on corn. You can see um, where the, the nitrogen fertilizer rate, um, zero pounds per acre, and uh, the uninoculated versus the inoculated, 14 bushel response. And then you put on 91 pounds of nitrogen an acre and really didn't, didn't make any difference whether you're inoculated or not at that rate. But you can see that the inoculation yielded pretty close to what 91 pounds of nitrogen did. Now, does that mean that this replaces 91 pounds of nitrogen? Eh, probably not. Uh, you can see that the uninoculated at zero pounds was still pretty good. I mean, on zero pounds of nitrogen, that's a pretty good yield. Um, so there's probably a lot of soil nitrogen in this field anyhow. Um, I'll show you another trial. This is probably a little closer to realistic expectations of what to expect. You can see with no nitrogen fertilizer applied, and this was an average of six trials, six locations in India, um, 12 bushel response to inoculate with azospirillum. Um, you can see at 36 pounds of nitrogen per acre, um, there's still a benefit to inoculation, but it's not as big. Um, you get your best benefit from these where you're not nitrogen fertilizing. And you can see that, well, inoculation didn't quite produce as well as 36 pounds of nitrogen. So how much nitrogen do you get out of these free living nitrogen bacteria? Uh, it, it's hard to say, um, but in this case, it looks like maybe, oh, you're maybe in the 30 pound range uh, would be reasonable to expect. That's not enough in a corn soybean rotation to maximize corn yield. It's not enough in most US cropping systems to maximize yield by itself. And so that's one reason that these inoculants have never really caught on. They're mainly used in, in I hate the term third world country, I think it's rather insulting, but let's just say less developed countries um, that don't have easy access to fertilizer and, and have small land areas where they can't really justify the equipment to put anhydrous ammonia or other fertilizers on. This is something you can walk six miles to town and carry it in your pocket in an inoculant package and treat your whole 10 acres. So um, just has never really caught on in the U.S. But does that mean it we can't use these. I, 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 think, I think there's tremendous potential for these organisms, actually. Let me show you. Take a look at this field. I mean, this is a mixture of both grasses and legumes and broadleaves. Um, you know, we've got some sorghum and some millet out here, uh, along with some sun hemp and some cow peas. And 
um, a mixed species cover crop. I mean, this is mostly what we deal with at Green Cover Seed is mixtures like this. Um, what if, now you're not gonna put nitrogen fertilizer out here because if you do, all those legumes won't nodulate and they won't produce free nitrogen for you. That's one of the reasons we put this out here is to get to capitalize on the legumes and the free nitrogen they produce. Um, but if you don't put nitrogen out there, the, the grasses are not going to live up to their potential. So what if you treated this with a, an inoculant containing free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. So not just the legumes produce nitrogen, but also the sorghum and the millet. How much benefit does that give you? An extra 20 pounds of nitrogen? That's enough to produce one ton per acre of additional green sorghum forage. And that nitrogen doesn't go away. When you pasture this, it comes back as manure and urine and it's still in the soil to benefit the following crop in the rotation. But I think there's in, in these mixed grass legume situations where we're not applying external nitrogen fertilizer, I think these, these free living nitrogen fixers can be really beneficial. And, and this is mostly what we do at Green Cover Seed is mixtures like this. And uh, you know whether they're annual or perennial, um, mainly for pasture and a high percentage of legumes. This is, this is where these free living nitrogen fixers have a real fit in my mind. Um, now, one question I've been getting a lot, uh, I think I, I started keeping track. I had three calls on this yesterday, one today. Someone wanting to know, what can I plant with my corn so I don't have to put fertilizer on my corn? And I, I hate to burst people's bubbles, but you will get very limited nitrogen benefit from a companion legume in this year's corn crop. Now, what I have here is a picture of, of cow peas as a companion crop to corn. And most of the nitrogen that those cow peas make is in that cow pea biomass only a very small portion of the nitrogen those cowpeas made was leaked out in the root exudates where the corn can pick it up. Now you, you can often see when you plant companion legumes in an unfertilized situation, you will a lot of times see a green up of those corn plants that where the roots are in and connected with the cowpea, but it, it's almost never enough to what I would say produce a, an economically viable corn crop. Um, does that mean that we discount this? Uh, absolutely not. I think there's a lot of value to this companion cropping deal, but you, you have to realize the limitations. Now, how can you, how can you, um, how can you capitalize on this system here? I think one thing is let's have a legume cover crop growing prior to this. Um, let's, let's have some, some nitrogen in the form of protein prior to growing the corn out there. I think that's important. Let's do our winter cover crop or maybe a summer annual cover crop the summer before, maybe both. Um, the next thing is when we plant the companion, if we want to maximize the nitrogen transfer over to the corn, if that's one of your goals, I think it's important that we inoculate with mycorrhizal fungi. And this, this picture shows uh, the little yellow things sticking out, the little peninsulas or fingers that are yellow there. Those are roots from two adjacent plants. And the mycorrhizal fungi are the white filaments, the threads. And you'll see that those white threads are connecting the roots of those two plants. Now, I've seen a little video clip at a conference on mycorrhizal fungi where they used motion picture x-ray film and they had an alfalfa and a brome grass plant side by side and they were showing a picture, the film of the roots. 
these were growing in a growth chamber and they put radioactive labeled nitrogen in the air above both plants. And the radioactive labeled nitrogen was in, went into the soil, was fixed into plant available forms by the nodules on the alfalfa. And within about 45 seconds, you could see the little glow in the mycorrhizal fungi hyphae move from the alfalfa to the grass root. 45 seconds and it was over there. Ordinarily, I was taught in college that for a legume to benefit a plant next to it, it had to first die and decay. And for the most part, if you are in a system lacking mycorrhizal fungi, that's largely true. That there will be some leakage of root exudates from that, but it, most of the time that's fairly limited. But with mycorrhizal colonization of both plants bridging them together, you can get an almost immediate transfer. Now, again, most of the nitrogen will still be in the legume plant, but the mycorrhizal connection will greatly facilitate sharing of resources. So if you want to really take advantage of companion cropping, I would try to make sure you have mycorrhizal fungi populations out there. Now the other, and I think the other thing you can do is, is inoculate with free living nitrogen fixers. I think that's a situation where you're trying to minimize your amount of purchased nitrogen fertility, try to capitalize on as many of these little, like the Chinese say, you know, if you want to break a wall instead of one big hammer, use many small hammers. We're using many small hammers here uh, to try to reduce our nitrogen fertilizer needs. Now, another thing that people are interested in is not just, I, I think most people are aware that you can, you can biologically make nitrogen. And that's been known by most people in agriculture for a long time, but said, well, yeah, you can make your nitrogen, but you got to buy your P and K. Is, is that true? Um, in most cases, it is true. How, however, let me, let me show you some things. Um, most of the nitrogen that we apply as fertilizer is, is water soluble, orthophosphate or, or uh, polyphosphate. And when we apply that to the soil very quickly, there are chemical reactions that start taking place that reduce the availability of that phosphorus. Phosphorus in water soluble form is tied up by calcium. It's tied up by iron, it's tied up by aluminum, it's tied up by manganese. These reactions take place very quickly. And so, because phosphorus does not move in the soil, it, we can't really top dress it, put it on after the fact, we try to put it all on pre-plant. That means it has, what we put on has to remain available for the entire season. So when we, realize that 85% is going to get tied up and we need to make sure that we have enough available to last. That means we traditionally apply seven times more phosphorus than what we need to get in the plant to make sure it's available throughout the entire season. So what do we do different? Well, one thing we can do is we can add things to that phosphorus fertilizer that keep it available longer. And I've got a couple things here on, on the picture. Um, one is humic acid. And I've got a picture of halo, which is the, the form of humic acid that we, we sell in association with our partnership with Elevate Ag. And uh, humic acid will complex with the phosphate ions. And that complex is still available for plant uptake, but it's not subject to fixation or not as subject to fixation. That complex will, will remain available to plants much, much longer than the phosphate without the humic acid. Another additive, I've got the brer rabbit molasses there. Um, any sort of energy source, and molasses has high levels of soluble sugars. It is, when you apply molasses to the soil, you get a frenzy of microbial activity because you've got this really easily available food source. So when you add molasses to that phosphate fertilizer, um, 
it's readily, quickly taken up and incorporated into microbial bodies, microbial compounds that are no longer water soluble. They're not subject to the, the uh, being tied up like water soluble phosphorus is. They're now slow release, slowly trickled out organic compounds that break down and release small amounts of phosphorus throughout the season. So by combining these compounds or these um, products together with phosphorus fertilizer, the theory is that we can apply less. Now, I, I haven't seen the research to know exactly how much less, uh, but the theory itself is very sound. It's very interesting. And uh, I, if any of you listening have some experience with this, I, I'd sure appreciate you chipping in and, uh, and, and giving us your experience. Um, and then what about, what about the phosphorus and potassium that's in our soil? Let's just talk about phosphorus. You know, I live in an area where we're told our soils are deficient in phosphorus, therefore we need to fertilize. Well, if you look at the analysis of shale and limestone, if you talk to a geologist, get an analysis of all the chemical elements that are in those rocks, shale and limestone are oceanic sediments, sedimentary rocks, uh, a little less than half a percent phosphorus. You say, boy, that's, that's not very good. Well, let's, let's do some math here. If you look in the top three feet of the root zone, you know, if every six inches weighs 2 million pounds, three feet weighs 12 million pounds. If you do the math, 12 million pounds times 0.0045, we have 54,000 pounds of phosphate an acre total in our soil. But you take a soil test, traditional soil test, it might tell you we got 30. What's the difference? Well, obviously we're, the soil test is an extraction that's supposed to tell us how much is available to plants. And the geologist test, which is what we're looking at here, tells us how much total there is. That's, that's an insanely huge discrepancy between available and total. Why, that, why is there that big of a difference? Well, one is that the vast majority of this 54,000 pounds of phosphate is locked up inside rock particles. Now, does that mean it's never available? If it was never available, there would never be plants growing anywhere on earth, right? I mean, think about it. All this had to become plant available at some point in time. Somewhere down the line, there are forces of nature that render these unavailable sources of phosphorus into available or we would not have soil, we would not have plants now. There would be no life on earth. So when I was, I was planting a crop of rye once and it was late summer, just unbearably hot. And the, the surface of the drill was so hot, I couldn't even touch it. And so to load up the drill, I backed up into a, a woodland next to my house by the field and uh, let it cool down for a little bit. And then I'd fill the drill and go out and plant in the field. Now out in the field, I applied 120 pounds of nitrogen. I put on 50 pounds of phosphorus and 10 pounds of sulfur and a pound of zinc and a third of a pound of copper. I mean, everything that I thought this plant could possibly use fertility wise. When I was filling the drill up in the woodland, I spilled some seed. The next spring, the rye in my field was, you know, about middle of my chest high. The rye in the woodland, which has never, ever, ever been fertilized in history, was well over seven feet tall. Now, I don't know what's in my woodland that is not out in my cropland. Whatever it is, I want it in my cropland. Well, what is it? I suspect it's biology. It's biology. Um, all this biology is fed by, well, let me back up a little bit here. What kind of biology is out there? What am I missing? 
this is a picture of a pine root or a pine seedling. And you say, wow, look at the size of that root system. What you're looking at there is really not root system, at least not mostly. I, I just drew an outline here, the little red line. That's the size of the pine root. Everything else you see there is mycorrhizal fungi. And so most of the, look at the surface area of that. The amount of soil explored by that mycorrhizal fungi is far greater than what the root by itself does. So for an immobile nutrient like phosphorus, mycorrhizal fungi can just be absolutely huge. And most of our cropland is really very deficient in mycorrhizal fungi. Um, we had all of our fertilization practices are based on the assumption that we do not have mycorrhizae present. And it's not so much just the mycorrhizae. This is a microscope view of mycorrhizal fungi. And you see all those little particles that are all over these, you know, looks like strands of spaghetti. All those little specks on there look like cookie crumbs on spaghetti or Parmesan on spaghetti, I should say. Um, all those little chunks of Parmesan on there are bacteria. And those bacteria, many of those bacteria are capable of extracting minerals out of rocks. If you've ever peeled a lichen away from a rock, a lichen is a plant and a fungus combined. That fungus nourishes the, the, the plant, feeds the fungus sugar, the fungus secretes acids that dissolve that rock and there are microbes on that fungus that allow that feed both the fungus and the plant minerals. This is the way nature is supposed to work. And our cropping systems, because why do our cropping systems not free up those minerals when natural systems do? The biggest thing is, is because our cropping systems have been mostly devoid of this root exudates. It takes energy to make those systems work. Those bacteria need fed every day. Because we have had long fallow periods in our cropping system, we've deprived those bacteria of root exudates. What happens when you have organisms that have a lifespan of a day or two and you don't feed them for 180 days? They die off. This is why we have to fertilize in cropland. We have starved our natural systems that produce fertility. No one has fertilized the redwood trees in California. They grow 300 foot tall. How? If you have cropland and you don't fertilize, your corn doesn't get three foot tall. This is why folks said, when you restore the energy flow into the system, those microbes, and, and we may, may have to initially restore some of those microbes, but those microbes will start going back to work for us. And, and this is not a system you will build up in a year, maybe not in five years, but it is a system that the more you can feed these microbes, the more they'll work for you. And just to show you what can be done, uh, this is a, a Haney test. Um, I wanted to share with you. Uh, this was, if you look at the available nutrients down at the bottom, bottom left-hand side, 14 pounds of available nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphorus. Pretty low. I mean, this, this is not what most people would consider a highly fertile condition. The potassium's good, but here's what the farmer did. Um, they planted a mixed species grazing crop. One of our, this is not his field. This is a photo one of our customers provided and part of our uh, photo contest that we have for our soil health resource guide. Um, but it was put to a summer multi-species grazing crops, very similar to this one. And then the next fall, prior to planting of the next crop, they took another Haney test almost exactly one year after the one I showed you. And look at the, now I'm gonna remind you, look at that, 14 pounds of nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphorus. In the meantime, summer grazing crop, mixed species cover crop, and without adding any additional fertilizer, 
Here's what the next Haney test said. Can biology work for you? Um, let me ask you this. Why is everybody staying home right now? Because of a biological organism. Can biology work? It's apparently shut down our economy. Um, biology works. And, and if we understand it, and I don't fully understand this process, I don't, I'd like to talk to somebody who actually does. I just know that there's some amazing things happen when you start feeding your biology. Um, another expensive area is weeds. Um, picture here in, in the photo, um, this is a field that was sprayed six times. It's supposed to be a soybean field. I think you can see one little soybean plant in there struggling to survive. Uh, just completely taken over by Palmer amaranth. It was sprayed, I think, four times with Roundup and then twice with Cobra and still nothing but pigweeds. I don't know how many dollars an acre they put of herbicide into this field, but it's a complete loss. And is there a better way of doing things? Um, there is. And unfortunately, when I say controlling weeds without herbicides, people automatically assume I'm talking about tillage. I'm not. In fact, tillage is really a pretty poor way of controlling weeds, and I'll, I'll show you why. Um, this is the emergence of pigweed seed by the depth of burial, and you can see once you get pigweed seed very deep, it just doesn't come up, and people say, oh, there you go. If you bury those pigweeds, they're not going to come up. Well, that's true, but what will come up is the pigweeds you buried last year. I'll show you how this works. Because the deeper you bury, if you look at this, um, all these pigweed seeds start out 100% viable. And you can see like the yellow line where you buried it. The deeper you bury those pigweeds, the longer they remain viable. Um, if you let pigweed seed just simply, or any weed seed, remain on the soil surface, it'll have a very high mortality rate. In, in fact, one year of laying on the soil surface will kill 90% of pigweed seeds. All kinds of animals eat them. Uh, they lose germ, they mold. There's all kinds of hazards that can happen. When you bury them, they will live longer. So leave them on the surface. They're easier to deal with there. And the other reason is when you do that burial operation, most, especially if this is pre-plant tillage, many weed seeds need a microsecond burst of light in order to germinate. Look at this, where they tilled, now this was in a greenhouse, where they tilled during light, 98% germination on pigweeds where they did the same process, but in the absence of light, only 14% come up. Tillage stimulates weed germination. Um, now, how can we use that, that little bit of knowledge I shared with you about the depth of burial to control these weeds? Um, maybe instead of using tillage to bury it, what about growing a cover crop to bury it? I mean, Pigweed seeds only have enough energy to grow about three quarters of an inch before they run out of juice. And they have to have hit sunlight. By the time that seedling elongates to three quarters of an inch, it has to hit sunlight or it dies. It will starve. Now, corn is a very big seed. It can come up from a substantial depth, whether that's depth of soil or depth of mulch. If we leave the pigweed seeds on the soil surface, but create a mulch, that's more than three quarters of an inch thick. And those, those weeds are mostly going to starve out before they hit sunlight. And you can see the rye mulch here, kilograms per, per square meter. Um, over here at the far right, that's about three quarters of a ton per acre of rye mulch. That, that's not a lot. And we'll revisit the rye mulch later. Um, another means by which you can use cover crops for weed control is allelopathy. And uh, the plant I've got here, this is Mexican bottle brush plant. And it contains chemical compounds that inhibit the growth of other plants. And uh, 
why is this important? <sighs> Excuse me. The scientific name of the Mexican bottle brush plant is Callistemo. Sound familiar? That's the plant from which they derive the original compound they synthetically produce now. It's a synthetic analog of the compound found in the Callistemone plant. Is this an effective herbicide? I think if you used it, you'd say, yeah. See the little pink flower next to the Callisto name? That's where it comes from, Mexican bottle brush plant. So yes, plant compounds can be very effective for weed control. And one of the plant plants that produce some very strong natural herbicides is rye. Uh, rye produces uh, some benzoic acids. Uh, the name of one of them is called DIMBOA, which is an acronym for a very long chemical compound that I won't even try to pronounce. Um, but rye produces three of these benzoic acid compounds that are very suppressive of, among other weeds, mare's tail and pigweeds. Uh, two of our worst weeds now. So rye can be used very effectively. There's another mechanism at work with some of these. I'll show you how this works. You can see the line right down the middle of the field. To the left, we grew a cover crop. And to the right, there was no cover crop. And you see the abundance of weeds where there is no cover crop. Um, why is this? Well, could it be the allelopathy? Could it be the blocking of the light? Um, what happened here, and, and it could be both of those, but there's another mechanism at work as well. You see how well the soybeans are growing. What can soybeans do for themselves that most weeds can't? It's fixed nitrogen. When you use the winter cover crop to suck up all the available nitrogen and sequester and hold it in the mulch, these, the weeds have no nitrogen to grow with. Soybeans don't care, they make their own. So by using cover crops to manage nitrogen availability, to temporarily sequester it, now that nitrogen didn't disappear, it's still there. It's in the, in the residue. It'll rot and it can feed next year's crop. This is building up your big pool of organic nitrogen, remember? So you tie that nitrogen up temporarily, you give your legume cover crop, or you give your legume cash crop, soybeans, a fighting chance and uh, they now have the competitive advantage over weeds. Now you say, well that, and it, this rye thing before soybeans is very effective pigweed control. You can see, uh, you look at that two month after planting deal, um, about 90% control of pigweeds by number. Now, what they don't have in this data is the biomass of the pigweeds, because in my experience, um, the pigweeds that do come up in a rye cover crop are so starved for nitrogen, they, they really have difficulty growing. So, Dale, we're going to go about another two more minutes and then we're going to have to open it up to questions. Okay. Um, another means, uh, and this is just a sorghum cover crop that has been frost killed and then a group of uh, a crop of peas planted in here. And you can see the same pea crop at harvest, same concept. Now, you say, what if my next crop needs nitrogen? Like my next crop is corn. I, I can't use this. I can't tie up nitrogen out of corn. Let me show you. This is a hairy vetch cover crop being roller crimped down and corn planted directly into it. Now, perfect weed control. This is no-till organic. No tillage, no herbicides, no weeds. How does this work? Well, obviously, the nitrogen in that vetch is not available to the weeds, nor is it really available to the corn until it breaks down. But what you can do as a manager is put nitrogen right down that row, whatever form you care, and if you're organic, like in this situation, fish hydrolysate or blood meal, some high nitrogen organic source, or just if you're not organic, just start a fertilizer to keep that corn plant vigorous. And then you can see a little later, still no weeds, healthy green corn. So pretty good system. And this is a situation using a live living cover crop, uh, 
spray out a band with the planter, then come back in about this stage with a mowing device, cuts off all this clover, blows it at the base of the corn plants for mulch to both control weeds and feed the next clover crop. Now, uh, I am going to, whoop, skip down to, well, wanted to uh, mention, uh, do have a couple books for sale. I'm asking $30 for managing pasture, 25 for the drought resilient farm. And um, also, um, as you see here, soil health resource guide. Uh, those are completely free. We, we would be happy to send you on either electronic or um, the paper copy if you prefer. Um, and visit our website at greencoverseed.com. So, Noah. Yeah, and with that, the resource guide, you can request a, a free copy of that on our website. If you just go to www.greencoverseed.com, uh, you can get that and we'll cover the shipping costs to ship that to you. Also, Dale's books are excellent, well worth the $30 in, in education and savings alone. I, I can't tell you how many people I've heard talk about how much uh, they have even saved on their farm by reading those books. So well worth the $30. Uh, thank you, Dale. I really it's a lifetime that. supply of Salmonex. <laughs> yep. Um, we're going to get going on some questions here real quick. There was actually quite a few in the chat uh, as well as in the Q&A on how you actually apply mycorrhizal fungi, molasses, and um, similar products. Do you have an answer for that? Um, the mycorrhizal fungi uh, can be, uh, the easiest way is just apply it to the seed. Um, the spores, very durable. They can handle all kinds of, they can handle sunlight, freezing, drying. Um, they're really pretty tough. Um, as long as, and the hyphae, are, are fine as long as they have a living root as a host. So you apply the spores where they're going to contact a root. The, the root tip of the root has a, a hormone, an exudate called strigolactone that stimulates the spores to germinate. So as long as those spores are put where the root can intercept it, it can take off and go. And you really only need about one spore per square foot in order to get good colonization yield. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the inoculation at a full rate costs about uh, $12 an acre. That'll give you two spores per square foot. So you got one to, one to use and one spare. Um, and as far as the molasses and the, the humic acid, that's obviously easiest if you're using a liquid phosphate fertilizer. Uh, you can also mix it with 28% uh, nitrogen, has a number of the same benefits in uh, turning a water-soluble fertilizer into a stable, slow-release fertilizer through microbes. Um, it, it's not as easy if you're using dry fertilizer, obviously. Um, that's going to take a little more creativity, but I, I know people that are doing it. They're using some sort of device to place dry fertilizer and then injecting a liquid that contains molasses and humic acid right in the same zone. And, you know, that's, that's a mechanical issue, not an agronomic one. Okay, uh, from Kent, will rotational grazing of a cover crop significantly reduce the amount of nitrogen available to the following cash crop? Um, yes and no. Um, grazing, um, you are going to lose some nitrogen during the grazing process. About 75% of what the animal ingests will come back out as manure and urine. The issue, it, so 75% is still there. Some goes in the animal, some's lost through volatilization. Um, the bigger issue is distribution. And um, if you are continuous grazing, um, just given the entire field, you'll see a migration of nitrogen towards the water source and shade. Um, wherever they go to lay down will end up being where all the fertility ends up. Um, when you're rotational grazing and you're getting more uniform distribution, 
of that manure and urine, um, it's much better. Now, problem with that is, is you're taking um, however many square feet an animal grazes in a day to meet its needs and the defecation and urine spots that she will produce is about 25 square feet. Um, so you're, you're taking all the fertility from a large area and depositing on 25 one foot squares during the course of that day. So the dis distribution of that may be in hot spots surrounded by relatively impoverished areas. I would not count on a grazed crop to meet a lot of your fertility needs on the next year. Um, what it does do is, again, be in this for the long haul. Uh, the grazing of the crop is where you make, where your cash flowing. Um, use all that manure and urine buildup as your long-term fertility reserve. That's where you're building up your pool of organic nitrogen and phosphorus compounds. Um, use it as a soil, a soil health program, not so much a fertilizer program. Um, I would not back off on your fertility, um, your fertilizer program uh, initially. I mean, be, be on the conservative side, I would say. This stuff all works, but it all takes time. And, and build that system up. Don't shortchange your crop, be disappointed, and then just quit. I mean, that's the worst thing you can do is, say, well, this was supposed to work and it didn't. You know, be on the conservative end and, and don't sacrifice a crop on principle. Okay. Uh, Fernando said, Dale, could you please uh, write the name of these cover crops fixing nitrogen? Here in Sonora, a few uh, use Cespania in fixing mm -hmm. legumes. Yeah. Fixing legumes, excuse me. Um, so if you want to kind of, I wouldn't say talk about every single list, but <laughs> if you can name yeah. a few or even there's, there's, there's really too many to list. Um, I would, best advice I can give on that is go to our website and, and watch our YouTube videos on the individual uh, species. Now, obviously the conditions that we have in Nebraska or in Texas are going to be different than in Sonora, um, but a lot of the a lot of the products that work in our summers do work in Sonora as well. Um, our winters are going to be drastically different, obviously. Um, but the only way you find these things out is by doing some experimentation, uh, do some planning, evaluate things. Uh, don't look for a recipe. Um, Try to learn as much as you can about the individual plants. And again, go to our website, look at the YouTube videos, uh, learn as much about the agronomics of the individual species and, and plant diverse mixes and, and let your conditions tell you what will and won't work. Don't spend too much money on any one particular species, but um, have enough diversity out there so that if, if one of those species is a complete failure, the cover crop itself can still be a success because the other components in there work. So um, now visit our website and, and I mean, that's why we have it on there. That's why we have that information on there for you guys to use. And I wanna also shout out to Jerry. He is on here, Jerry Lanners. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. The picture of the, that rolled, beautiful rolled cover crop uh, with Harry Vetch in the corn. So yep. thank you for that, Jerry, and kind of leave. Yes, and job. beautiful crop. One of the, uh, impress oh, one of the most impressive pictures in my, in my repertoire. Thank you for sending us that, All, that series of photos, really. Okay, question from David says, what levels of organic matter do you like to see in cropland and what levels in pastures? Oh, um, I think your sweet spot really for both is between five and 10%. I think there's uh, some diminishing returns once you get above 10. I mean, uh, there are, you know, highly organic, like peat soils, muck soils, that are 50% organic matter, 25% organic matter. And um, 
once you start getting over about 20% organic matter, you actually start having problems with the availability of some mineral nutrients. Things like copper become very unavailable. And sometimes you have to foliar apply copper on soils with excess levels of soil organic matter. Now, those are in drained wetlands. You know, it took centuries to build up that organic matter. In, in a field soil, I don't think we're, I don't think we'll ever be in the, within our lifetime or our children's lifetime or grandchildren's lifetime. I don't think we'll be in the situation where we have to worry about too much organic matter. But uh, a lot of people tell me that once you get above about 4% organic matter on a clay soil, and, and I've seen this happen, the soil just changes. It changes, the, the nature of it changes. It doesn't look like the same soil it used to. And those of you who have taken soil organic matter levels from you know one or two percent to four five six uh you know chip in here and give us your observations but mine is that there seems to be a threshold of about four percent on a you know a, a silty clay loam you know a, a fairly heavy soil once you get above that four percent organic matter things just change everything just really starts to work things become easy and please uh, share your observations out there. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, we are going to wrap up. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to email uh, dale at greencoverc.com. And there's his cell number. That's 785-614-2031. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Like I said at the beginning of this, if you, thank you are very joining much. in halfway through or anything we are recording all these so they will be um, posted to the website and that can be found uh, at greencoverseed.com and you'll just search webinar so with that thank you so much dale for your time and i'm sure you'll get all kinds of questions tomorrow thank so. you thank you for facilitating this yep no problem uh next week thank, we thanks everybody for watching yeah, next week we'll have um, a little more in-depth look at annual warm season cover crop species. So we're going to talk about some of the characteristics of individual cover crops. So thank you guys. Enjoy your week and we'll see you next Tuesday. See you.